The Johnstown Flood, known as the Great Flood of 1889, occurred May 31, 1889 after the catastrophic failure of the South Fork Dam on the Conemaugh Reservoir. The flood killed 2,208 people and was one of the worst floods in American history. Johnstown is a city in Cambria County, Pennsylvania, 43 miles southwest of Altona and 67 miles east of Pittsburgh. Johnstown was originally organized as a town in the year 1800 by the Swiss-German immigrant named Josef Schantz. The settlement was originally known as Schanstadt, but was annexed to Johnstown. Johnstown is known for three things, iron, coal, and steel, and by 1860, the Cambria Iron Company of Johnstown was the leading steel producer in the United States. As a result, Johnstown became the highest producer of steel in the area, outproducing both Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Through the second half of the 19th century, Johnstown made much of the nation's barbed wire as well. Johnstown's geography also contributed a lot to the reason why their industry was prosperous. The town's geography places it in a river bend. Water surrounds it on all three sides, and many levees and dikes were used to keep the water from flooding the city. Lakes and reservoirs were used to regulate the water flow that would come in from the mountains that were adjacent to the town. So as a result, floods were almost a yearly event in the valley during the 1880s. The South Fork Dam was an earthenwork dam on Lake Conma. The South Fork Dam was originally built between 1838 and 1853 by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as a part of the canal system. It would soon be abandoned by the Commonwealth and then sold to Pennsylvania Railroad and then sold again to private interests. Henry Clay Fick, born December 19, 1849, was an American industrialist, union buster, and art patron. He was also the chairman of the Carnegie Steel Company and played a major role in the formation of the U.S. steel giant. Henry had a lot of dealings in Johnstown, mostly concerning the town's large iron and coal deposits. His job was to manage and identify possible industrial operations for Carnegie Steel, and he felt that Johnstown was a good candidate because his citizens were familiar with steel and mining work. Henry Clay Fick wasn't the first industrialist to see Johnstown as a major opportunity. The town's environment changed from working-class miners to upper-class industrialists in less than 10 years. And for years, the most powerful industrialists of the time gathered at Lake Conma, an idyllic body of water made possible by Pennsylvania's South Fork Dam. The lake was their secret retreat. It was a place to fish, hunt, and consolidate their wealth. Henry, being a very wealthy man, felt that he needed to include himself in every elite social gathering. Historians have interpreted his actions to be actions of a narcissist, or simply someone who seeks validation from others. The South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was a Pennsylvania corporation which operated an exclusive and secretive retreat at a mountain lake near South Fork, Pennsylvania, for more than 50 extremely wealthy men and their families. The fishing club was established by Henry Clay Fick, and in 1880, at the suggestion of an entrepreneur named Benjamin Franklin Ruff, Henry purchased the South Fork Dam and Lake Conma that were near the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. You see, Benjamin had envisioned a summer retreat in the hills above Johnstown, and he promoted this idea to Henry Clay Fick. The purchasing of the dam and the lake was met in preparation to move South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club closer to Johnstown. Lake Coma, when it was still being used as a reservoir, was approximately two miles long, one mile wide, and 60 feet deep near the dam. The lake had a perimeter of seven miles and could hold 14.3 million tons of water, and during the spring, the lake covered over 400 acres. The South Fork Dam was 72 feet high and 931 feet long. It failed for the first time in 1862, and although well designed and built when new, a history of negligent maintenance and alterations were later believed to have contributed to its failure on May 31st, 1889. Additionally, the club members made inadequate repairs to what was at the time the world's largest earthen dam. Daniel J. Morell, a member of South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, was concerned about the safety of the dam and the thoroughness of the repairs made to it. Morell had even sent his own engineer to check the dam to assess what can be done to keep it from breaking. Even with one of its members saying that the dam was at risk of breaking, the club fatally lowered the dam by three feet and augmented it to accommodate automotive vehicles. Also, the club made poor repairs and maintenance during the high snow melt and rainy seasons. On May 28, 1889, a low pressure area formed over Nebraska and Kansas. By the time this weather pattern reached over western Pennsylvania two days later, it had developed into what would be termed the heaviest rainfall event that had ever been recorded in that part of the United States. The U.S. Army Signal Corps estimated that 6 to 10 inches of rain fell in 24 hours over the region. On the morning of May 31st, in a farmhouse on a hill just above South Fork Dam, Elias Unger, president of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, awoke to the sight of Lake Conma swelling after a night of heavy rainfall. Unger ran outside in the still pouring rain to assess the situation and saw that the water was nearly cresting the dam. He quickly assembled a group of men to save the face of the dam by trying to unclog the spillway. It was blocked by broken fish traps and debris caused by the swollen water line. Most remained on top of the dam, some plowing the earth to raise it, while others tried to pile mud and rock on the face to save their eroding wall. John Park, a personal engineering contract for the fishing club, considered cutting through the dam's end to relieve pressure, 
but chose not to because it wouldn't stop what everyone was anticipating. Twice, under orders from Unger, Park rode on horseback to the nearby town of South Fork to telegraph the office to send warning to Johnstown explaining the critical nature of the eroding dam. Unfortunately, Park did not personally take the warning message to the telegraph tower. He sent an unknown man instead. Unger, Park, and the rest of the men continued working until exhausted to save the face of the dam. They abandoned their efforts around 1.30 p.m., fearing that their efforts were futile and the dam was at risk of imminent collapse. Unger ordered all of his men to fall back to high ground on both sides of the dam, where they could do nothing but wait. Fourteen miles out, Johnstown was already flooded. The water rose as high as 10 feet in the town, and this trapped people in their homes and made the streets inaccessible. Between 2.50 and 2.55 p.m., the South Fork Dam breached. A LIDAR analysis of the Combe Maw Basin reveals that it contained 14.5 million cubic meters of water at the moment the dam collapsed. Modern dam breach computer modeling reveals that it took approximately 65 minutes for most of the lake to empty after the dam began to fail. The first town to be hit by the flood was South Fork. The town was on high ground and most of the people escaped by running up nearby hills when they saw the dam spill over. Some 20 to 30 houses were destroyed or washed away and four people were killed. Continuing on its way downstream to Johnstown, 14 miles west, the water picked up debris such as trees, houses, and animals. And at the Konma Viaduct, a 78-foot high railroad bridge, the flood was momentarily stemmed when the debris jammed against the stone bridge's arch. But after seven minutes, the viaduct collapsed, allowing the flood to resume its course. Before hitting the main part of Johnstown, the flood surge hit Cambria Ironworks at the town of Woodvale, sweeping up railroad cars and barbed wire in its moil. Of Woodville's 1,100 residents, 314 died in the flood. Soon, boilers would explode when the flood hit Gaudier Wireworks, causing black smoke to be seen by Johnstown residents. Miles of its barbed wire became entangled in the debris in the floodwaters. Some 57 minutes after South Fork Dam collapsed, the flood hit Johnstown. The residents were caught by surprise as the wall of water and debris bore down, traveling at 40 miles per hour and reaching the height of 60 feet in places. Some people, realizing the danger, tried to escape by running towards high ground, but most people were hit by the surging flood water. Many people were crushed by pieces of debris, and others were caught in barbed wire from the wire factory upstream or drowned. Those who reached the attics or managed to stay afloat on pieces of floating debris waited for hours for help to arrive. At Johnstown, the stone bridge, which was a substantial arched structure, carried the Pennsylvania Railroad across the Conemaugh River. The debris carried by the flood formed a temporary dam at the bridge, resulting in the flood surge rolling upstream along the Stony Creek River. Eventually, gravity caused the surge to return to the dam, causing a second wave to hit the city, but from a different direction. Some people who had been washed downstream became trapped in an inferno as the debris piled up against the stone bridge caught fire. At least 80 people died there. The fire at the stone bridge burned for three days, and after the flood waters receded, the pile of debris at the bridge was seen to cover 30 acres and reached a height of 70 feet. It took workers three months to remove the massive debris, the delay owning part to the huge quantity of steel barbed wire from the ironworks. The death toll was calculated as 2,208 people, making this disaster the largest loss of civilian life in the United States at the time. This number of deaths was later surpassed by the fatalities in the 1900 Galveston hurricane and the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. According to records compiled by the Johnstown Area Heritage Association, bodies were found as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio, and as late as 1911. 99 entire families died in the flood, including 396 children, 124 women, 198 men were widowed, and 98 children were orphaned. And one-third of the dead, 777 people, were never identified. Their remains were buried in the Plot of the Unknown and Grandview Cemetery in Westmont. In the years following the disaster, some people blamed the members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club for their modifications to the dam and failure to maintain it properly. The club had bought and redesigned the dam to turn the area into a vacation retreat in the mountains. They were accused of failing to maintain the dam properly so that it was unable to contain the additional water of the unusually heavy rainfall. The club was successfully defended by the firm Knox and Reed, later Reed Smith LLP, whose partners Philander Knox and James Henry Reed were both club members. The club was never held legally responsible for the disaster. Knox and Reed successfully argued that the dam's failure was a natural disaster, which was an act of God, and no legal compensation was paid to the survivors of the flood. Frank Shomo, the last known survivor of the 1889 flood, died March 20, 1997 at the age of 108.
I hope you enjoyed the newest installment of the Horror Story series, and if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you liked the video. If you have any specific requests for any stories you want me to read or research, let me know in the comments down below. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe, and if you're old, make sure you hit that bell. And as always, we gotta thank the Patreon supporters, so thank you to Horror Star, Maria, The Caustic, Simon Possum, Pro Cookie, and Finny. Without their support, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now. If you want to have a say in tomorrow's video, go to my community tab and vote in the poll that's posted right after this video. And as always, stay zesty. Yeah! <laughs>